Are you looking to become a Tier 1 operator in the gaming world? Elevate your games with Black Sight Studio Terrain. Center, part of the SitRap Podcast channel, as featured on Podbean, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, on Tabletop.com, and other platforms. If you like what you see, please consider supporting the SitRap with a like, comment, follow, or subscription. You can also support us on Patreon, or check out our great SitRap merchandise on Zazzle.com. Last week, we started our look at the Vietnam War. Very quickly, we went over the general course of the conflict, looking at its roots, major events, and eventual outcome, wrapping up with a summary review of the factions one might find on a gaming table. Now I'd like to zoom in a little, to look at specific areas of the Vietnam War, and discuss how they can be accurately and enjoyably brought into our war games. So we've all seen the movies. Platoon, Full Metal Jacket, Hamburger Hill, We Were Soldiers, The Green Berets, Platoon Leader, The Iron Triangle, Casualties of War, The Siege of Firebase Gloria, to name a few. Add to this TV shows like Tour of Duty and China Beach, and it's easy to think of Vietnam as a singular setting, a battlefield of jungles and rice paddies and little else. The truth is that Vietnam is an expansive country strewn with different types of battlefields, where different units from different nations for different types of battles over different time periods. So let's break it down and take a look. By the end of 1965, all sides of the Vietnam conflict accepted that a sustained military effort was in the making. Accordingly, the South Vietnamese Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVIN, in coordination with the Americans, organized four major tactical zones named predictably 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Corps sectors, these would be the most widely recognized subdivisions for the ongoing war in South Vietnam. Now a quick note, the Americans had their own structure built around what they called field forces. These did not correspond on a one-to-one basis with the Arvin Corps sectors. They did change slightly during the course of the war, and the Americans didn't have an official field force for every area of South Vietnam. For these reasons, we'll be sticking with the Arvin model for sake of clarity. The mission of each core sector was to secure government-controlled areas, contain and interdict communist incursions, and conduct aggressive operations to reduce areas under communist control. There were further zones of operation outside of South Vietnam, which we will cover after we review wargaming in these four main core tactical zones. Starting off, we have 1st Corps, which covered the northernmost part of South Vietnam. Beginning at the so-called demilitarized zone, uh, this was set up to supposedly divide North and South Vietnam, 1st Corps extended south through Duc Phu. It contained the old imperial capital of Vietnam in Hue City, and also Da Nang, the huge airbase that would serve as America's first real staging point into Vietnam. So, what features would we find on a First Corps wargaming table? Well, first up, this is where you see practically all of the U.S. Marine Corps involvement in the Vietnam War. If you want to play a U.S. Marine force, you're playing in First Corps. U.S. Marines used helicopters a lot less than the Army did, instead preferring to tie down the country with artillery fire bases connected by roads defended by tanks, notably the M48A3 Patton. The Marines also had sizable naval artillery support from U.S. warships off the coast. Remember how thin the country of Vietnam is this far to the north, and how far a heavy cruiser or even a battleship can hurl a high explosive shell. 
The U.S. Army was also involved up here, with heavy artillery battalions and also air mobile units like 1st Cavalry and 101st Airborne Divisions. 1st Cavalry fought at the end of the Tet Offensive, while the 101st was famously involved in the Battle of Ashaw Valley, as we see in the movie Hamburger Hill. Terrain-wise, we're seeing mountains. Lots of mountains. The country only flattens out a little bit along the coast. Not many inland roads existed here in those days, which is why the Army used mostly helicopter-borne units and the Marines defended their highways so fiercely. Route 9 leading to Quezon is a good example. There's also some very heavy urban fighting here during the Battle of Hue in 1968. For the Communists, we're talking mostly about the North Vietnamese Army, or the NVA. We're obviously very close to North Vietnam here, and the infiltration routes out of Laos are very close to key American and South Vietnamese targets. This was about as close as we're going to get to a full-scale Army versus Army conventional war in Vietnam, at least during the American involvement, with the NVA even using tanks once against a U.S. Special Forces base at Long Bay. First Corps is where you find some of the biggest units and the heaviest firepower, especially for the Communists. If Flames of War Nam is your thing, start looking here. The biggest fireworks would probably be the Arclight B-52 bombing raids outside of Khe Sanh, which at one point tripled the high explosive power released by the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Sadly, First Corps is also where we see the incident at Mai Lai site of the worst American atrocities committed during the war. Things to avoid in First Corps would include tunnels, mostly the Viet Cong, although there are some exceptions where the Viet Cong and the NVA did fight together, Anzacs, and riverboats. Next down is Second Corps. Geographically, this is the largest corps sector, extending from Tan Quan in the north to Phan Thiet down in the south. It's also where America's involvement in Vietnam really started in earnest, at least on the ground, with the I Drang battles, part of Operation Silver Bayonet, in November 1965. This area of South Vietnam is often called the Central Highlands, with large-scale ops taking place here in 1966 and 67 across places like Kong Tung, Play Ku, and the Darlak provinces. The NVA and VC also hit this area very hard during the Tet Offensive in early 68, particularly at places like Dok To and Quy Nong. But after the Tet Offensive was put down, while large-scale action would certainly continue, this region honestly didn't see its share of major operations from 1969 onwards. On the table, this is probably the least jungly part of Vietnam. It's largely dominated by the broad plateau of the Pleiku Islands, and the altitude here means that wet, dense jungle is more of an exception rather than the rule. Open fields of fire, broken by dense forests that look more like traditional woods, might be more the norm here. In the movie We Were Soldiers, which does take place in this sector, note that most of the foliage in the background looks almost North American or European. This is actually pretty accurate. This is mostly a U.S. Army dominated sector, with plenty of helicopters and not many tanks. Arvin units would stick to the coastal cities, only occasionally used for ops ranging into the interior. Another thing to remember is that most of the fighting here takes place earlier in the war, 65, 66, and 67 as the NVA builds up for the Tet Offensive. This is also where we find Kamran Bay, the absolutely gigantic military base built to support the ongoing U.S. military effort in Vietnam. So some things to avoid here are U.S. Marines, Anzacs, there's no riverboats, no naval gunfire support, no tunnels really, and most battles taking place after mid-1968. Next we come to Third Corps, and this is the big one, sometimes known as the U.S. Second Field Force. This is the slice of South Vietnam that includes the capital of the country at the time, Saigon. By far the most densely populated region of the war, it also sees the heaviest concentration of the National Liberation Front, otherwise known as the Viet Cong. In fact, most of Third Corps' heaviest and most viciously contested battlefields 
start right outside of Saigon, then run north and west toward the Cambodian border. This is where we see War Zone C, War Zone D, and the infamous Iron Triangle. Ku Chi and the so-called Hobo Woods are also where you'll find the gigantic complexes of those infamous Viet Cong tunnels. It's in this remote border region of Third Corps where the movie Platoon takes place, where we see large-scale operations undertaken by units like the 1st U.S. Infantry, the Big Red One, 4th U.S. Infantry, and 25th U.S. Infantry, Tropic Thunder, along with the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, which accounted for many of the U.S. Army tanks in the Vietnam War. So if you want U.S. Army tanks on your table, this is probably your spot. For building war games in this area, here are some things to look out for. This far south, the terrain really starts to flatten out a lot. The coastal area is heavily developed, with towns, cities, and sprawling agricultural areas. These include not only rice paddies, but also huge rubber plantations. A holdover from the French colonial period, when pre-synthetic rubber had to be extracted from tropical trees. These can make for interesting tables that are iconic without being stereotypical. There are also some river boats in operation here, mostly along the Saigon River and its tributaries, flowing out of that northwest jungle we were talking about in War Zone C. The enemy here is always hidden, usually VC, especially in the cities. Only as you move away from the coast do you encounter more NVA infiltrating out of Cambodia. This is one of the few areas where the NVA and the VC work together closely with the VC arming, feeding, housing, and equipping large regiments of NVA, while the NVA supported and trained the so-called main force battalions of the Viet Cong. This is probably the most iconic area of the war. The terrain includes sprawling rice paddies, endless tunnel complexes, smothering jungles, and a deadly mix of both NVA and VC. This is also probably where the VC came closest to becoming a semi-professional army, with main force battalions pulled together into full regiments and even divisions, 9th and 5th especially, particularly along the Cambodian border areas of War Zone C. Finally, we come to the far south of Vietnam, 4th Corps sector, dominated by the Mekong Delta. This is a massive river complex, fanning out across 15,000 square miles. Like most river deltas, the Mekong is a breadbasket, home to massive agriculture and thousands of small farming villages. There are roads and bridges here, but the uncountable branches of the Mekong River mean that water remains the best way of travel for free world forces, communists, and civilians alike. The Americans didn't invest heavily in defending the Mekong Delta through most of the war. Instead, the Arvin was left as the primary combat component with three full divisions here. So if you want to put Arvin troops into real combat, this is probably your spot. The Americans, meanwhile, detached just one brigade of 9th Infantry Division and restructured it into what they called the Mobile Riverine Force. These men cooperated with extensive U.S. Navy brown water operations carried out largely by Patrol Craft Fast, or PCFs. The Communist forces here were almost exclusively Viet Cong, not the NVA. Small civilian villages are everywhere, usually connected by waterways rather than roads. If you're serious about riverine operations, obviously this is definitely your spot. Build your hooches up on stilts, because flooding was always a major problem here, and the very flat terrain means that tidal variances can be quite dramatic. Also, invest in some civilian boats, often called sampans, as well as military craft. Now, let's look at the air war. Like the ground war, this was divided into a number of areas. Of course, tactical air power was used by the U.S. Air Force out of places like Kamran Bay and Tonsonon Airport, to support ground troops in contact with enemy forces on South Vietnamese battlefields. Further north, U.S. Marine Corps fighter bombers out of Da Nang supported Marines in combat along the DMZ and Laotian border. U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet also had carriers in what was called Dixie Station off the South Vietnamese coast. And South Vietnamese air power was also used extensively to support troops 
in combat on the ground. Often, a bombing line would be set up behind suspected PC or NVA positions, hopefully preventing escape as American ground forces went in to mop up. For war games, such air ops would best be used as part of a ground operations game because American and South Vietnamese air power was never seriously challenged over South Vietnam by the Vietnamese People's Air Force. So, no dogfights. However, communist ground positions always bristled with heavy anti-aircraft defenses, so American F-4 Phantoms, F-5 Freedom Fighters, A-4 Skyhawks, and propeller-driven A-1 Sky Raiders should never have a free ride. Meanwhile, North Vietnam was being bombed in Operation Rolling Thunder. Initially, this was tactical fighter bombers only, a vain attempt to keep the war's escalation under control. This was undertaken by the U.S. Air Force out of bases in Thailand, like Kurat, Uban, and Tak Lee, using types like the F-4 Phantoms and the F-105 Thunder Chiefs, often called THUDs for short. Meanwhile, the Navy's 7th Fleet had Yankee Station, another operating area for carriers further north, a base for rolling thunder missions using F-4s, A-6 Intruders, A-7 Corsair IIs, and other types. Now, these bombing missions over North Vietnam were contested, and hotly, by the VPAF. So here's where you have your dogfights. Here, your unit is the MiG-17, as seen in games with my friend Dylan using Air War C-21 by Wessex Games. These dogfights can become interesting, as many American types are armed with missiles only, while MiG-17s are armed with guns only. MiGs should always outnumber the American Air Force or Navy by at least 2 to 1, and often be supported by surface-to-air missiles or SAMs. Interesting scenarios could include Bat-21 style games, where an American pilot has been previously shot down, but before the Navy can get a search and rescue helicopter to him, more fighters must clear the skies of nearby MiGs. Another interesting scenario type could be a Wild Weasel game. Wild Weasels were specially trained squadrons whose job it was to draw fire from enemy surface-to-air missiles. As the radar control station that controlled these SAMs locked on, the enemy's own radar signal was used as an aiming point for what was called HARMS, or high-speed anti-radiation missiles, like the AGM-45 Shrike. One well-placed Shrike could blind a whole network of enemy SAM sites, but you had to let them lock onto you and shoot at you first. Only later in the conflict were B-52s used over North Vietnam. However, MiG-17s couldn't usually fly high enough to engage them, so instead the Soviet-supplied SA-2 Guideline SAM was used. I'm not sure how good of a war game this would make, unless again, your table includes tactical airstrikes to find and destroy SAM sites to protect incoming B-52s, perhaps handled as off-board targets or units. As the war escalated in North and South Vietnam, it was only a matter of time before it bled over into neighboring countries like Cambodia and Laos. The primary cause for this was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a massive hidden transport network to outflank the fortified demilitarized zone and move men, supplies, and equipment from the north to communist positions and base areas nested in the south. However, this also made areas of Laos and Cambodia legitimate bombing targets and were dealt with accordingly. On the ground, though, U.S. and South Vietnamese forces were never really allowed into Cambodia and Laos, which could make for interesting no-go lines on the table to be exploited by a Viet Cong or NBA player. Cambodia would eventually be invaded, briefly, for three months in 1970 to get at these routes, but it caused the worst anti-war protests yet seen in the United States. The South Vietnamese forces also briefly invaded Laos as well, in Operation Lam Sun 719, but again, this caused far more political fallout than military gain. Real battles were brief, and the duration of these ops were very short, so I don't know how much war gaming mileage we can really find here. So, that's our look at different areas of the Vietnam 
Hopefully I provided a little insight into where certain battle areas were located and what kind of features should and shouldn't be included on these particular tables. Come back next episode when we look at Vietnam War tactics and doctrine and how these might be reflected in tabletop mechanics. We'll be looking at asymmetrical warfare and what that term actually means, denial of battle, hidden movement, air mobile operations, how to fight a war and war game without objectives, the effect of media, casualty evacuation, the use of tactical air power, and also special forces in Vietnam. Now it's time for your intel report. Have these episodes primed an interest in wargaming in the Vietnam War? What kind of engagement do you feel like tackling? Or what kind of battles have you done already? Do you have any questions on the material presented so far? Get involved in the comments below. For now, this is Ariskany, and as always, Tango Mike for listening.